Hey everybody, Dr. Rob Silverman here. Facebook Live Tuesday. Uh, got a lot of feedback from yesterday's Facebook. Uh, so today we're going to talk about posture. What a great topic. Um, so many people uh, have asked questions about posture. Love to start things off with a quote. Posture is a shadow of movement. So understand that I can, when I look at your posture, understand how you're going to move, how you're going to perform, and through movement assessment tests, I'm going to be able to have a good idea or a predilection almost of which body part, which muscles are going to be injured. So posture without questions, a shadow of movement. Um, Sheridan uh, said that, and you're going to hear a lot about who Sheridan is today. Um, we're going to talk about some of his theories, but I'm going to really talk about posture, what you should look for, and we're going to start with the idea of head posture. There was a study that just came out, and um, I have the... Um, conclusions right here. So they did a study on the relationship. This is the first study of its kind, the relationship of head posture and functioning of the human body. What effect head posture had on the actual functionality? What, what happened when the head function was aberrant? So abnormal head posture or positioning and we're going to go into details. We're going to really explain to you how your head is uh, like a bowling ball. It's between 9 and 12 pounds. It's actually 10 pounds. How every inch it's forward puts an exponential stress on your neck. Um, this abnormal um, head posture and positioning affected specific changes. Number one, muscle activity. Interesting. We're going to talk about that quick, really uh, soon in that we're going to talk about the idea of what it does in the muscle activity, which muscles it overactivates, which ones it shuts down, and how this starts the whole cascade. Number two, proprioception. Your balance and space of where you are. Your proprioception, so your idea, I have a torticollis, so I always have a little uh, lateral uh, skewed view. Even when I played basketball, my proprioception, my perception of where things were, a sense of awareness of where you are, was slightly off, and I had to, if you will, overcompensate for that. In addition, you'll find out that a different head position will change your breathing pattern, and that's something we should talk about on a Facebook Live, your ability to breathe. Um, I'll give you a little segue into that. We've talked so much about breathing. Um, people don't realize that the phrenic nerve, something that I'd like to... Um, uh, demo for people how to affect the phrenic nerve. It's a breathing nerve, and the phrenic nerve actually works in um, sync, believe it or not, at times with what we call the vagus nerve. So your pattern of breathing, whether you're a chest breather, a stomach breather, <sighs> much more common uh, breathing. And last uh, but not least, neck pain. And we talked about the neck pain before, how neck pain and neck pain led to inflammation and systemic inflammation. So um, once again, just to review and to cap, Abnormal head posturing positioning has this effect on the body. Number one, it changes muscle activities. It actually aberrantly changes muscle activities. Proprioception, pattern of breathing, and of course leading you in neck pain. And I'm a big proponent that if the neck is forward, it's going to round your shoulders. And I want to segue into that. So we call this the neuromusculoskeletal detonation sequence. So the idea of your head, that bowling ball, like I said before, 9 to 12 pounds, 10 pounds, every inch that it's forward, it's an exponential stress on your neck. Just like that. So how many times have you walked down the street? How many times have you been in a store? And look, most people have what we call anterior head carriage or anterior forward head uh, posture. Um, there's a lot of ways to treat that, and we're going to go through the different uh, treatment ideas after we go through the whole... Um, sequence from top to bottom. So once again, the head will um, lead you uh, forward and lead you down a path. So interesting, an overriding theme is the pain dynamic. So many patients come in and have complaints about pain. So what happens is typically there's a tight muscle, then you have an inhibited muscle, you get a strain point. Your strain point is typically a joint, there's pain, and ultimately with pain, patients have a complaint of pain. They come in and they see you. That concept of what I just went through is uh, based on Sheridan's law of reciprocal inhibition. So if I were to turn around and do a bicep curl, my bicep is getting tighter, hopefully. My tricep shuts off. My brain shuts my tricep off, but my bicep is shortening. That's the idea of one part getting tight, the other one neurogenically getting inhibited. Your brain doesn't, uh, your brain, I guess the best way for me to say it 
is that your brain kind of tells your body what to do. It should not be a thought process. But if there's some aberrancy to that, so if my bicep's just a little like this, what, what's going to happen is I'm tight. My bicep's going to get tight, and it's going to put a strain on the air, the localized air, put a strain on the body. The reason it's going to put a strain on the body is the body's all interconnected. We all know that. The body's all interconnected through a multitude of structures. One of the structures is the nervous system. So that nervous system is going to now be on alert. Something's tight. Something's a little too weak. There's a postural change. That leads to the idea of your proprioception. Couple that with fascia being this saran wrap of the body. Think of fascia when you pull the skin off a chicken and you see that white stuff. Fascia attaches to the skin and it communicates. So there's something called tensegrity. Not trying to get too technical, but tensegrity, it's our ability to what holds us tight. If we took our fascia, we'd all fall apart. So that pull, that fascial pull, and their fascial fascia right here, especially where the in bicep to bicep, two heads, insert, that fascial pull is what leads you down a path of tightness through the body. So when people say they do myofascial release, they're working the muscle, the myotendinous junction, and fascia. If they're not taking into account fascia, they're really not doing soft tissue, myofascial release. And there's many different things that pertain to that idea of myofascial release, like factor, grass, and active release, and the litany list of others. So having said all that, you have an idea of Sheridan's law of reciprocal inhibition. He actually won a Nobel Prize in 1932 for that exact law. So let's go through the cascade. The cascade's real simple. You'll have a tight muscles, your pecs get tight. They round. They inhibit your what we call your mid trap muscles, which is sort of an incorrect. It's more of your scapular muscles. Uh, your mid trap scapular muscles, or can I should I say your controlled movers. Your scapula, your shoulder blade, should move. When your scapula doesn't move, you're going to have shoulder problems. You're going to have anterior head posture. It's going to lead you down a path of musculoskeletal faults. So the pecs tighten, your scapula poses an issue. Your suboccipitals, they're right up here. Your suboccipitals get tight, and your deep neck flexors, your longest coli and your longest capitis get tight. So you begin to look like that. These guys shorten and um, they get inhibited, excuse me, these guys lengthen and these guys shorten. When do you see that? You see that very typically in concussion. You see that typically in a whiplash. So what is the strain points? What joints are injured? TMJ, TMD. So if you're as straight as I can be, when you jut forward, you put a strain on the joint right here. You're putting a strain on your jaw line, if you will. Your jaw, uh, has a joint and it's called temporal mandibular joint, leads you to TMD, temporal mandibular uh, dysfunction. There's a disc in here and it can wear away. There's a lot of chiropractors who do adjust the area. They also um, look at the neck, which I'm a big proponent of getting the neck back to put the jaw in place. So this anterior head posture or this what we call upper cross syndrome leads you to TMJ. You also have cervical thoracic c7 and t1 there's seven vertebrae in the cervical spine in the neck and t1 that junction those transitional junctions usually are typically circled in a good manual practitioner's office that junction also is a strain point it's sort of a pivot point then you get the gh joint with your shoulder now this is really interesting. I share this with all the docs. You guys are going to love this. The position of your scapula is one of the first things that I always look. So I use a, um, a line from Yanda, he who treats the side of pain is lost. I'll say that again. I said it to a patient this morning on the phone. He who treats the side of pain is lost. Many people come and say it hurts right there, right in the front of your shoulder, rotator cuff. I get that. But when your shoulder rounds, it compresses on your humerus. Compressing on your humerus leads you down a path of subacromial um, impingement, which ultimately will damage your rotator cuff. A perfectly positioned acromium is about a quarter of an inch in space between the acromium and the humeral head. When you slam down on it, you're impinging and you're also damaging the rotator cuff muscles all in here. Interesting. The rotator cuff muscle's main property is a dynamic compressor and rotator of the humeral head. So if you roll those away, you're going to damage your rotator cuff. So many people 
have rotator cuffs and impingements, or they have impingements and rotator cuff. If you have one, you're probably going to get the other. Many of the things that I just mentioned come from the fact that your scapula has a malposition, or if I can use the technical term, scapula dyskinesis, meaning it's moving in, in movement kinesis, dyskinesis, not moving in a proper manner. So if I don't release the scapula, if I don't get the scapula to move, if I don't assess the scapula, you're not going to have good shoulder health. That comes from anterior head posture. So we took care of the top. We took care of, um, if you will, above the waist. Let's look at sort of like from the waist and down. So you, anybody ever have a tight back muscle, you know, like um, erector spinae? Typically, when you have an erector, tight erector spinae, you're also going to have inhibited abdominal muscles. So your back muscles get tight to support a spinal injury. They shut off your abdominal, your core muscles. So every time you get back injury, you've got to reset your core. You can't go back to what you were doing before or more. You've got to actually reel it back in to reset the intrinsic muscles at your core level. So tight muscles in your back, your erector spinae. Um, and here's one for you. What's the most superficial back muscle? Let me see who gets that. I'm going to look into questions in a moment. Let me see who's watching. What is your most superficial lower back muscle? That's a question. Let me know if you, uh, you want to take a guess. Go for it. Now, the erector spinae um, is tight. It actually shuts off those core and abdominal muscles. Then you get your psoas muscle, your hip flexor. So I'm going to stand up. Your psoas muscle goes from here. It's from T12 all the way down, missing what we call the L5 disc, going to here, the lesotrochanter on the femur. So let's go through the anatomy once again. T12 to L5, not touching the L5 disc. It's the only muscle that touches the lumbar spine, the ilium, the sacrum, and an extremity, the lesotrochanter on the inside, medial side of the femur. Your psoas is without question a critical muscle. When your psoas is tight, it compresses your spine and it actually puts your lower back or your lower extremity into an anterior pelvic tilt. So right now I'm tilting the hip forward, slamming down on my joints. I wish I had my spine in here to do that. Your psoas then shuts off your glute max muscle. Not the strongest muscle in the body. It is the strongest muscle in the body. Not the strongest muscle in the body per square inch. It's one of your ear muscles. Now, with the erector spinae being tight and your abdominals being shut off and your psoas being tight and your glutes being shut off. Most people don't realize when your glutes shut off, you fire your erector spinae, they get tight. Your glute muscles are a major issue. You've always got to look, when you have lower back, you got to refacilitate, reactivate glutes. Um, I can't tell you how uh, not enough practitioners, trainers, anybody doesn't look to activate the glutes. It's a critical element. And if anybody, again, a lot of people called yesterday, have a question, free 15-minute consult on any things that we talked about. Let's get to the strain points. The thoracolumbar junction, remember those transitional segments are critical elements. The lumbosacral junction, another critical element, and of course the hip. These are all strain points. The symptoms are really simple. SI, lumbar sacral, hip, stiffness, and pain. I do want to make a point about the hip and the psoas muscle. I had a patient come in yesterday and they had lower back pain. And I, I always, always test the hip first. Always want to take a look at the hip because the hip is a multi-planar joint. If the hip is unable to move, you're going to have to move your lumbar spine too much. And flexion, bending forward, and rotating like in golf. So many of the people around here play golf, got a lot of golf courses in Westchester County. You will damage your lumbar spine because of your inability to move your hip. Most of these people have tight hips. They have tight psoases. They may even have some osteoarthritis and the loss of joint space on the hip, which will lead you down a path of damaging your back. So we talk about flexibility. We want flexibility and stability both in your hip because if your hip is inflexible and stable, it will injure your lower back because we're put together in movement by interconnecting joints. And believe it or not, we're not supposed to move our spine that much. We're supposed to move our hips more. As we said yesterday, we don't want to bend at our hips. We want to bend at our spine. So they call that lower cross all together, upper and lower cross. So let me get to the um, questions in the comments over here. Hey, Dave. Yep. Got the haircut. We went down. Let me tell you guys what we did for a haircut in about 20 seconds less. Went to the city, parked outside, didn't let anybody in, double masked it, went upstairs. 
Uh, they checked our fever. They, they, they made us wash our hands with sanitizers. The hairstylists, believe it or not, were wearing double masks. They were wearing splat masks, just like I have over here with the splat mask. They were in lab coats. I thought they were going to perform surgery. So um, that's what we had to go through over here in New York City. But got my hair cut. Uh, thanks a lot. Zug, great to hear from you. Um, yeah, nice cut. I appreciate that. I finally got a cut. You know, I, I look, I look uh, neat and clean. What's the question again? The question is, what is the most superficial lower back muscle? Let me hear what everybody has to say. And as, as I wait, um, I guess I said it really quick. As we wait, I just wanted everybody to know that um, once again, I'd like you to like this, comment, share it. We did a great job sharing yesterday's information. If you could do the same with this information, this is vital. Uh, got a lot of questions about posture. Got a lot of things that pulled me back into what we call more pure chiropractic. We're waiting for some answers. Let me tell you a couple of the ideas and suggestions for both upper and lower before I get, uh, take 90 seconds before we um, sign off. So a lot that I would recommend, I'll give you what I call my fab five or my super five. Number one, you know, hey, I'm a chiropractor. Adjust, adjust the area, adjust the thoracic, adjust the neck, adjust the lumbar. My chiropractors are clapping now. Uh, absolutely. Soft tissue, myofascial release, without question, great choice. For both the cervical and the lumbar, traction, excellent. Traction in the joint is going to help. As you guys all know, low-level laser. I'm a big proponent of a low-level laser. Kony is my guy. I always talk about low-level laser, decrease pain, increase range of motion via cellular level. Number five. Here's the other question, uh, number five, oh, try P, uh, no, number five would be exercise rehab. Exercise rehab for both the neck and, and the lumbar spine. I've got a whole um, uh, web exercises here that I can share with everybody. And let me kick in the sixth one. Hey, great choice, magnesium, calcium, valerian root, excellent for muscle stiffness. It's not the trap, but that's a great guess. It's not the trap. But it's a great guess. So I'll, I'll be looking. I'll be checking in. Uh, I'm going to try and do a few more Facebook Lives. We're trying to come on most every day, Monday to Friday. If we get that second today, obviously, I had a little time. I'm real happy. And if you want me to talk about something, please let me know. Um, it's been all my pleasure. As always, oh, wait a minute. We got another guess. Quadratus laborum. Hey, that's a good guess also. So let's go through some of these muscles. So Mamie said the trap. The trap is a very superficial muscle. It's a large diamond-shaped muscle. That diamond shape is very superficial. Um, but it is not the most superficial lower back muscle. But the trap does go to the lower back. The QL is actually kind of deep, Dave. That's okay. It's um, involved in a hip hiker. But let me give you a little takeaway while we wait for some more people to guess. The QL is actually a lateral spine. Here it is, lateral spine stabilizer. It works in conjunction with the psoas because the psoas also is a lateral spine stabilizer. So the psoas is a deep anterior muscle. The QL is a deep posterior muscle, and it works with uh, lateral stability, and they call it the hip hiking muscle. So when people say, I have a short leg, they should go look at the QL. Well, we got a couple more guesses. Lat dorsi it is. The winner is the lat dorsi, the latissimus dorsi, the V-shape, is the most superficial lower back muscle. Great, great answer. Love it. So it's been my pleasure. I hope everybody found this. there's some value in this. Uh, please, once again, like, comment, share. Let's get it going. Everybody have a great day. Always yours in health, Dr. Rock.